Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful presentation, which is about to begin. I'm Mark Grayson, and I'm the director of Trinity Spiritual Center. And you, this evening's Zoom host, which is something that I don't typically do, um, but I will do my best to facilitate <coughs> um, our time together. Um, we've all been through so many Zooms over the past couple of years that I don't think I need to run through uh, the protocols here, but just to remind everyone, first and foremost, as you can see by the blinking red light, um, we are recording this presentation. So if for any reason you would like for your beautiful face not to appear in the recording, um, you can stop the video camera on your computer. Um, and uh, we ask that everybody please keep their audio on mute, at least for the beginning um, of this session so that we have the best possible audio um, from um, Peggy and Maureen uh, during our time together. Uh, and the last thing that I would um, note is that we will probably spend about mm, 30 or 40 minutes um, with uh, Maureen guiding us through a presentation that will help us better understand the world of iconography um, and, and give us a little bit more um, of a preview of the process um, that we will undertake in writing icons, those of us who might be thinking about participating in the workshop in June. And after the first uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll open up the session to questions. I ask that you put them in the chat box um, and um, Gail Ficken or I will read them uh, to Maureen um, just to facilitate that um, piece of the evening. So with that, I will turn this presentation over to Peggy. Thank you, Mark. And good evening, everyone. And welcome to Trinity Spiritual Center here in Southport, Connecticut. Uh, my name is Peggy Hodgkins, and I'm the rector at Trinity Church. And tonight we have the distinct pleasure of talking with the gifted iconographer Maureen McCormick. I first met Maureen in 2001. It was right around 9-11 when I was the associate rector at Trin another Trinity Church, This one, that one being in Princeton, New Jersey. And I found out about this amazing six day workshop that she was coordinating every summer in the parish hall. And I felt this real tug to join the group. But at that time I had a growing family and I had more than a full-time job and there just wasn't the time. Um, finally in 2012, I had the privilege of studying iconography with Maureen. Um, it was during my first sabbatical 10 years ago in 2012 and I got to write four icons with her and I loved every minute of it. I quickly found out that Maureen is a master and just an incredible teacher. Maureen herself attended her first iconography workshop with Vladislav Andreev. He's the founder of the Prosopon School of Theology, and he came to Trinity in 1996, in Trinity Princeton, that is. And although trained as a secular fine artist because she holds an MFA from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University, Maureen was immediately drawn to the medium and also to the mystical theology that informs the centuries old sacred art of the Christian East. And she is now an affiliate instructor of the Prosopon School. Um, so Maureen moved to Princeton area in 86 to join the staff of the Princeton University Art Museum. And she worked there for over 25 years. It was around that time that I was, uh, I was taking my first workshop with her and she was making a transition to devoting herself entirely to iconography. But studying with her was such a satisfying and prayerful experience. We would open our time in prayer and learn about the tools and the layering process of creating icons all in this prosopon tradition. 
Then in March 2013, um, Maureen was consecrated as Trinity Princeton's iconographer in residence. And that was a great recognition and an historical first for that church. So we invited Maureen to hold a workshop here at Trinity in Southport in June because of my sabbatical this year. I'm going away to another icon workshop in England and I wanted the congregation to enjoy uh, at the opportunity that I was experiencing. Um, and through Trinity Spiritual Center, uh, we now have this chance to learn with Maureen at Trinity stateside while I'll be in England. And this is all thanks to the Lilly clergy renewal grant that I'm receiving that we are able to bring Maureen to Southport. And with the help of our spiritual center director, Mark Grayson, and our fellow artistic parishioner, Gail Ficken, it's become possible to have a group study iconography in our own parish at a subsidized cost. I love spending time with Maureen, and I hope you will too. So I'm honored to introduce her to you tonight. My friends, please meet Maureen McCormick. Maureen, we're so glad to have you return to Trinity Church in Southport. <laughs> Oh, Peggy, thank you so much. And gosh, I hope I can live up to that very generous introduction. Um, so I've prepared a little talk, um, which, hang on one second, come on. Okay, is everybody seeing a big giant uh, Title slide, okay, iconographers for dummies. Oh, I mean Episcopalians. Um, <laughs> so my rather torturous road from the faith, the simple faith of my childhood uh, to doubt, to unbelief and back again would probably sound familiar to many of you. The very short version is I lost my faith right on time when I graduated from high school uh, and went off to college. That happened to coincide with the very premature death of my mother. Uh, and I was at that age unable to reconcile how could a loving God take my mother. Uh, so instead, I looked for meaning and transcendence in making artwork. And I majored in studio art as an undergraduate. And as Peggy says, I then went on to get my MFA from the Tyler School of Art. And an MFA and $5 will buy you a cappuccino at your local um, uh, coffee shop. So I had student debt and I was retrospectively grateful uh, to have followed my mother's advice, which annoyed me at the time, Two, if I insisted on being an artist, to at least learn how to type so I would have something to fall back on. Indeed, this skill landed me a job as a secretary in a museum registrar's office. And museum registrars are the ones that keep track of the art uh, and otherwise organize chaos. I found that I had an aptitude for the work and fast forward found myself um, as the registrar at the Princeton University Art Museum. Somewhere along the line, okay, 1988, I acquired a husband. We acquired a house. We had a baby mm -hmm. who's turning 20, has turned 27. Um, somewhere in there when my daughter Phoebe was just a couple years old, I heard that still small voice kind of coaxing me to come on back. And the Holy Spirit led me to Trinity Church, Princeton. And as Peggy says, I, that's where I took my first icon workshop with Vladislav. Now, I couldn't have told you at the time of what an icon was. Um, I was deeply suspicious, I would have to say, of religious art having grown up with, and please forgive me if you're fond of it, terrible, you know, holy card mm. art from the Catholic Church. <laughs> um, but my secular artwork, the stuff I made uh, as an art student had been largely symbolic and figurative, 
figurative. Um, I've been a printmaker, which is a tedious and absolutely not spontaneous and heavily process oriented, all of which suited my, um, uh, how shall I put this, um, my OCD personality. And so the jump to iconographer was really more of a itty bitty step. It married my interest in symbolism to the meditative tedium of process, it gave me a place to incarnate, a word I use here very intentionally, um, to incarnate my burgeoning faith. And I continued to study with Vladislav and others in the school until I found that I had somewhere along the line ceased to be a museum registrar with a kind of interesting side job and instead had become an iconographer with a day job. And so in 2013, I did step down from the very satisfying but all consuming position at Princeton to start this new chapter. On St. Patrick's Day, 2013, happened to be a Sunday. This Irish American was blessed as iconographer in residence at Trinity by Father Paul Jeans and supported literally by Vladislav, who has his hand on my shoulder. He's, uh, he's the one with the long white hair and my wonderful long suffering husband, Phil, uh, who's the one without the long white hair. <laughs> um, my title, Iconographer in Residence, is more than honorific in that I am literally in residence. Uh, the position is, as we say, non-stipendary, um, but I have a wonderful If We studio in Ivy Hall with a view of the church from my window that helps to remind me who I am and whose I am. Now the pandemic threw me a curveball, as it's thrown everybody a curveball, in that I have been unable to teach until very recently. So I'm once again a registrar with a full-time job, um, day job, working for Atelier Fine Art Services, a fine arts company in Philadelphia. Um, uh, for the time being. But retirement is not far away, God willing, and I look forward to spending more time in the studio and teaching in the next year or two. Enough about me. Any talk about icons has to start here. Um, and like the medieval cities that are built on the ruins of Roman cities, which are built on the ruins of pre-imperial cities. The tradition of icon is built on previous visual traditions. And in particular, and I'm sure it's not difficult for you to see um, how iconography developed from this tradition of funerary portraiture, um, in the Egyptian, now Egyptian city of Fayum. It was a Roman city. This is from the late first century and you can see it at the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore. It borrowed from pagan Rome as in this Roman second century AD mosaic of Orpheus. In fact, during the early years, when Christians were persecuted for their faith, images of Christ were made, but disguising him, as in this case, as Orpheus. You remember, he descended to the dead. That's in the catacombs in Rome. Or here as the Good Shepherd a figure also borrowed from the pagan world, also from the catacombs. Pictograms were a pretty safe way of depicting Christ. But of course, Everything changed once Constantine converted to Christianity in 313 and made Christianity 
I'm sorry for this one, the coin of the realm that is, in fact, Constantine the Great. It was now acceptable to depict Christ, uh, as in this fresco, perhaps one of the earliest depictions of Christ as a youth with a beard, and I, th I think looking quite Semitic and handsome. <laughs> And in those, those early years, the tradition of iconography continued to develop, culminating in many ways in this sublime image of, of called the Sinai Christ or Pantocrator, all sovereign. But unfortunately, the story comes to a rather abrupt end because of the Byzantine iconoclasm. Now the last, which happened in the seventh century, the last truly ecumenical council that was held before the great schism where the Latin speaking West broke from the Greek speaking East, I have trouble with left and right. Um, This council was convened to settle this so-called iconoclastic controversy. It was also it was held in Nicaea, uh, and so it is sometimes called the Second Council of Nicaea. The iconoclasts, the image breakers, argued that the Second Commandment forbade the making of images. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Their opponents, the iconoduals, or the servants of the image, countered that, yes, this was true before the incarnation. But afterwards, it was absolutely acceptable since in Jesus's own words, he who has seen me has seen the father. The iconodules won the day and went so far as to say that not only was it acceptable to create images of Christ, his mother and the saints, but that not to do so was to deny the full humanity of Christ and thus, to deny the doctrine of the incarnation. I want to say that again with emphasis. To deny the icon is to deny the full humanity of Christ. And it is for this reason that I've chosen this um, section from John's gospel, um, uh, which you may have trouble reading because it's pretty stylized writing. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son. Now the iconodules took great pains to draw a careful distinction between veneration, the act of showing honor to and worship, the adoration that is due to God alone. The Greek word for worship or adoration is latria, whereas the word for vener veneration is proskinesis, literally bowing down to, as was done in the Byzantine court before a person of a higher social rank. This is why if you've been to an Orthodox church, you will have seen the faithful crossing themselves, bowing down before an, oh my God, even kissing the icons. The iconodules argued that the honor being shown was not directed to paint on wood, but to its prototype, the particular holy person depicted. And it's for this reason that the name of the saint is always inscribed on an icon. To put this in terms that Episcopalians can understand and depending on where you fall, on the high-low church spectrum, when we bow our heads as the crucifer processes by with the cross held aloft, that is an act of proskinesis. We are not worshiping wood or polished brass, 
but showing honor to a man-made object that points us to Christ and reminds us of the sacrifice for us. Because, you see, at that time, merely a few hundred years after the crucifixion and the resurrection, people had no trouble believing in Christ's full divinity. It was his full humanity that they had difficulty grasping. Whereas now, with the advances of science and the so-called enlightenment, it is the divinity of Christ that is most often dismissed or outright rejected. Unfortunately, the canons of the council were incompletely and poorly translated from Greek to Latin. Tragically, the words proskinesis and latria were both translated as adoratio. The Holy Roman Empire decried the Byzantines as idolaters and the rest, as they say, is history. This and other misunderstandings and theological disagreements resulted in the Great Schism of 1053. And with that, Western Christendom lost a coherent theology of the image. The Feast of the Triumph of Orthodoxy is celebrated by our Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters on the first Sunday of Great Lent. Parishioners process around and through the church holding an icon from their home icon corner, reenacting the Byzantine procession held in 843 to celebrate the proclamation of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Sadly, we have no way of knowing how many icons were destroyed during the iconoclasm. The icons at the Monastery of St. Catherine in, on Sinai holds the largest number of pre-iconoclasm icons by virtue, ironically, of being having been outside the Byzantine Empire at the time. In these, we can see the very beginnings of the development of the complex system of symbols, stylization, and visual conventions that make an icon recognizable as, well, an icon. Once the production and veneration of icons was proclaimed to be orthodox, we begin to see the visual syntax of iconography maturing. These are mosaics in Ravenna. I'm very thrilled to tell you that I took that photograph. If you haven't been to Ravenna, and if you possibly can, you should go. What a difference a few centuries makes. Here we can really compare the relatively naturalistic Sinai Christ to this 14th century processional icon of the same subject made in Constantinople. I think you can see that the highlights have become much less natural, much more stylized. The 3D forms have been flattened. The space depicted has become very shallow. The utter strangeness of the icon lets us know that this is not a portrait of Christ so much as it is a symbolic representation of the great mystery of the incarnation. But then, guess what? The fall of Constantinople to the iconoclastic Ottoman Turks uttered in another wave of iconoclasm. The torch of iconography was passed from Constantinople to other Eastern Christian countries, notably Russia, where it arguably reached its zenith in the work of 
Theophanes the Great, who'd been born and trained in Constantinople, and his best known student, Saint Andre Rublev. Meanwhile, in the West, images had become untethered from the constraints of tradition and the canon. They were deemed useful for didactic purposes, a way to proclaim the gospel to a largely illiterate laity. But the humanism of the Renaissance allowed artists to depict Christ, his mother, and the saints however they wished, or however their patrons wished. Innovation rather than faithful adherence to tradition was celebrated. No longer did the honor accorded to the image pass to the proto prototype, but instead it remained right there on the surface of the painting. Perhaps in admiration of the artist's skill and who hasn't looked at a Michelangelo or a da Vinci and marveled how did he do that? or to envy the wealth of the patron who could afford all that gold leaf and the precious azurite that artists began to use on the robes of Mary, or to build the magnificent cathedrals that the paintings adorned. The image had become ecclesial decoration, an inanimate object that might be beautiful to look at and in its way edifying, but which was most decidedly not understood to be an instrument of grace. And so it went until iconoclasm. Don't worry, I'm not gonna say much about this beyond the fact that Calvin, the most iconoclastic of the reformers, based his iconoclasm on that bad Latin translation of the canons of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Truly, the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. It is only recently, 1984 to be exact, that we, by which I mean the Anglican communion, have come to understand that our own iconoclasm was based on that bad translation. And so now it is not unusual to see icons in Anglican or Episcopal churches. However, regaining our eyes to see has not, in my opinion, yet happened. And it won't happen overnight. I hope this short talk will be a small contribution in that direction. Any of you who have been in an Orthodox church, and this is the Cathedral of the Annunciation at the Moscow Kremlin, will have seen the iconostasis, literally the place of the image. What most of us would describe as a wall of icons separating the nave where the laity assemble from the altar where only the priests enter to celebrate Eucharist. However, the iconostasis rightly understood is not an impenetrable wall, but corresponds to the veil of the temple torn in two at the moment of Christ's death. The Orthodox do not see the iconostasis as a wall or a barrier, but as a window and an open one at that into heaven itself, into which they are gathered along with the great cloud of witnesses. Our Orthodox brothers and sisters do not pray to paint on wood. They pray through paint on wood alongside the saints who from their labors rest. In theory, we do this too, but as the old adage goes, out of sight, out of mind. The icon is sometimes described as the gospel in light and color. And indeed, once we have eyes to see, by which I mean once we have learned to read an icon, we can discern the entirety of salvation history within each canonically created icon. Somewhat like the Eucharist, though I hasten to say not as perfectly as the Eucharist, God created matter is transformed by human hands and prayer 
and offered back to God in thanksgiving. The historical methods used by the Prosopon school, egg tempera, gold leaf, and ground mineral pigments on carved wood boards prepared with gesso are well suited to an ascetic discipline such as iconography. They are laborious, painstaking, and they take years to master. And so to introduce the medium to eager, but mostly artistically untrained students, the school developed a progression of technical steps that breaks the process down into bite-sized pieces. Each step is then used as an imaginative springboard to introduce students to the more encompassing subject of iconology, the study of what it means to have been created in the image and likeness of God. Layering scripture, teachings of the early church fathers and other sources from tradition over each of these steps, the iconographer's spiritual imagination is engaged and directed. And in this way, the act of creating an icon may be understood and experienced as liturgical, whereby the iconographer reenacts the story of creation and salvation history writ large while simultaneously attempting to restore their own Imago Dei. For example, an icon's life begins with a board. I went, I jumped ahead there. You know, a board cut from a tree. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Often, a shallow indentation is carved into the surface of the board. After being sanded, the porous surface of the wood is sealed with glue, most often animal hide or fish glue. This recessed area of the board is called the kovchek, meaning ark or coffer, a special container for holding valuables. In this case, the treasure contained in the icon's kovchek are the holy images. You can think of them the, as a tooled and bejeweled gospel book cover. Often some element of the composition, for example, the hem of the saint's garment or halo will extend onto the frame of the icon as if to demonstrate that the reality that the icon presents may be invisible, but it is close at hand. Next gesso of the next, I forgot to tell you, a piece of linen is glued to the surface of the wood. The cloth gives the gesso something to adhere to and protects the paint layers from the inevitable expansion and contraction of the wooden board. Here we can remember that the Christ child was wrapped with bands of cloth and the crucified Christ was wrapped in a linen shroud. The iconographer is reminded that she is called to die to self and be born a new creation. The gesso is applied. Gesso is a mixture of chalk, marble dust, glue, and water. As many as a dozen layers of the liquid gesso is applied to the surface of the board before being sanded and polished to a smooth, hard, and yet absorbent surface for the paint. The emptiness of the pure white gesso is rich with symbolic potential. It evokes, for example, the emptiness ex nihilo, out of which God called creation into existence, as well as the uncreated light on that first day of creation. The purity of the white gesso also calls to mind the virginity of Mary through which the incarnation was achieved. After the iconographer has either drawn the image onto the gesso or transferred the sketch to the gesso board, 
And here, for any of you who are thinking about taking the workshop, I want to assure you of a couple of things. The boards will already be prepared. <laughs> um, six days is, it would take six days to prepare a board, much less to paint an icon. And you will be given a sketch that you will trace onto the board. Uh, it's sort of liturgical uh, uh, paint by numbers at the beginning, uh, beginning of the study. A mixture of red clay, water, and glue called bowl, uh, B-O-L-E, uh, is applied wherever the gold leaf will be applied. It's allowed to dry and then sanded and burnished until perfectly smooth and shiny. In Genesis, we learn that God formed Adam, Hebrew for human, and applying both to a specific human as well as humanity from Adama, Hebrew for clay. Although most often translated into English as God formed man out of the dust of the ground, the Hebrew play on words might be better captured by God formed earthlings out of the earth. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that we are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the works of your hand. Once the clay bowl has been polished to a mirror sheen, the iconographer leans close to the board and exhales a deep moist breath on it as if to fog a mirror or clean your glasses. The moisture reactivates the glue in the bowl, inspiring gold leaf to adhere to the surface. You might say that the gilded halos symbolize humanity before the fall, humanity as we were intended to be, made of clay, but inspired by God. The round halos that surrounds the heads of the persons and icons is a symbol of their holiness and are almost always gilded. I've seen them sometimes painted white and sometimes painted red. The circle having no beginning or end is of course associated with the eternity to which the saint has returned. Moreover, gold is one of the rare noble metals um, on earth. These are the metals that will not corrode or decay, oh, I touched the thing, let's go back, um, will not corrode or decay, and similarly then points to eternity. Interestingly, all the gold on earth was formed, and all the heavy metals, was formed by the collision of two neutron stars. These are two stars that have died through supernova explosion and what might be characterized as a cosmic resurrection. Once the gilding is completed, the iconographer dilutes egg yolk to form tempera. That is our medium, um, the, which will bind the pigments to the surface of the gesso. Recipes vary, but the Prosopon School uses dry white wine for its acidity and alcohol, which act as an agent and a preservative. Unlike oil paint, egg tempera dries very quickly and allows the iconographer to apply multiple transparent layers, giving the finished icon its characteristic luminosity. For millennia and for obvious reasons, the egg has symbolized the potential for life. And since hens lay more eggs in the spring in response to lengthening days, a symbol for Earth's annual vernal resuscitation. After the resurrection, the egg took on the additional symbolism of the tomb from which Christ burst free. The bright red vermilion line that outlines the halo is the first line that the iconographer paints. 
and provides a visual counterpoint to the gold. Red is the color of blood and so has long been associated with life as well as with sacrifice and martyrdom. Here again, the iconographer is reminded that those who love their life lose it and those who hate their life in this world will find it. The endless nature of the circle reminds this iconographer of her endless need to repent, rethink, and return to the Lord. Characteristic of all iconographic traditions is the dark foundational layer of paint, which in the Russian tradition is called Roskrish, from the Russian verb to open, as the white surface is open to color. The marbleized texture is achieved by choosing coarse earthy pigments, which is another way of saying dirt. <laughs> we paint with dirt of all variety. Uh, we dilute the temper with water and stirring it vigorously in the palette before we puddle each brush load on the board. We, we are forced to keep the board flat on the table rather than upright on an easel to allow evaporation to assist in the creation of the swirling texture. This resulting chaotic surface evokes the formless void and darkness that covered the face of the deep at the beginning of creation. Out of this flat plane of darkness, the iconographer begins to suggest three dimensions by applying several alternating layers of highlights and then floats. First highlights create volume while they create the visual impression of volume. Second highlights carve or facet the first and third highlights make the facets sparkle. Highlights enlighten the Roskrish visually as well as metaphorically. We can ascribe to them levels of consciousness. First highlights corresponding to the rational discursive mind that reasons, which is called Dianoia by Plato. Second highlights with the noose, the mind that perceives and intuits truth. And the third highlight with the immaterial mind of the angels and the celestial hierarchy. After each layer of floats, of highlights, that the highlights are floated with a transparent veil of pigment, which adds depth and complexity and allows the iconographer to build increasingly brighter and brighter highlights. Scripture warns us that the light of God is overwhelming to our mortal senses. Whenever Moses spoke to God on Mount Sinai, he veiled his face before addressing the Israelites. The Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctuary of Solomon's temple and dwelling place of the presence of God in Hebrew, the Shekinah, was hidden from all but the high priest by a veil. In the same way, the three disciples present at the transfiguration were permitted to see Christ's glory full of grace and truth, which was otherwise veiled in mortal flesh during his earthly ministry. For, as St. Paul tells us, now we see through a mirror darkly, but then we will see face to face. I'd love to say this icon was by my hand, but it is by Vladislav. Among the later steps involved in completing an icon, we paint final lines, inscribe the names, and do a lot of decorative um, doodads. One of the most dramatically transfiguring is the application of Ozhivki, the enlivening or life-giving lines to the flesh of the features. Can you see my um, cursor? 
Yes, okay. So you see these funny little rays of light. If you're in a museum and you're looking at an early painting and you're wondering if it's an icon or not, look for those. Um, uh, and as I said before, look for you know, the names or some other identifying symbols to let you know who you're looking at. And that will, if both of those are present, you're looking at an icon. Whereas earlier highlights are handled in such ways to imply that the light of the icon comes from within the saint, the zhivki dance and glitter on the skin, a sign that they have been graced by God to become partakers of the divine nature. In Eastern Orthodox theology, such union with God is termed theosis or divinization as they have lived their lives in an attempt to ascend to God, God finally condescends to them so that they might become by grace what God is by nature. One of, if not the very last lines the iconographer paints is the white line around the outside of the red line. Um, the red line is called either the Venchik, which is a word that means crown or diadem, um, uh, but it is also called the alpha line in that it is the very first line that we paint. Consequently, this last line, this white line, is called the omega line. It signals the completion of this iconological pilgrimage and brings the icon to its telos, its intended end. At the same time, the white line points the iconographer to the white gesso of their next icon. Once the icon has dried completely and the tempera has cured through a process known as polymerization, a mixture of refined and stand, very thick linseed oil um, is applied to the surface. In addition to sealing and protecting the icon, the olifa permeates the many layers of the tempera and gives the icon its characteristic translucence and imparts a unifying golden glow. The sacrament of chrismation, anointing with oil, corresponds to Pentecost, the bestowing of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the nascent church. Each completed and chrismated icon presents the iconographer with another opportunity to recommit themselves, to deny themselves, to take up their cross and to follow Christ. Finally, an icon is ideally blessed by the iconographer's priest and is then venerated and contemplated by the iconographer before being sent out into the world to proclaim the good news. All glory be to God. Thus endeth my prepared remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Maureen, that was absolutely wonderful. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think, I, mean, I just love the way that you um, walked us through the process of writing these icons and sort of relating it back to scripture and various uh, spiritual states of mind and even our own personal experience, uh -huh. um, which makes me do, uh, sort of makes me realize in this moment that it really is a form of prayer. Um, yes. Um, just it's just amazing to be able to go through that process even vicariously with you. So thank you <laughs> so much. Um, well, I am happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I suppose if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box, or if you want to raise your hand. Um, Ethan, maybe you can unmute anyone who has a question. Not seeing anything. I see two hands. <laughs> so let's go. Hi, Mark. 
<clears throat> it's Mary Foshif to speak. Hi, Peggy. Um, hi, Maureen. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, iconography. Um, I've had a chance. I lived in Cyprus five and a half years. Uh -huh. My my question to you is um, regarding the mosaics that you um, viewed. Um, are they also um, uh, thought of in the same um, vein as the these icons? Not quite, and neither are the wall paintings. So, what makes an icon um, different from? wall paintings and mosaics that are really part of the architecture is their portability, even if they're very large icons. And that is, be, they are, they are things, right? They, they have kind of an ontological, sorry for the big words, being, right? They take up space just like we do. Um, like stained glass windows and, and even the wall paintings, they create kind of an atmosphere, um, but it is, they're not thought of uh, in quite the same way as being really instruments of grace through which, you know, God can work if God so feels like it. Of course, God can do whatever God wants to do, but... Um, <laughs> Thank you. I hope that helps. Thank you. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Okay. It uh, looks like Cecily has a question. Ethan, can Cecily has a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I came to this. I don't know a thing about icons. I'm not even sure that I could have said what an icon was. All right. Oh. I really, really enjoyed your talk. And, and so my question is utterly basic. Uh -huh. Like, is an icon an icon because I painted in the process you described? Or is an uh, icon an icon because of the subject matter? Or could I paint a religious picture in my own way and say, I, I've just painted an icon. Who decides? And what is the deal? That's uh, a great question. Of the three options there. I think there were three. Number three, eh, not an icon. So the way I've come to think about this and, uh, and the way I try to explain it is, think of the monks in the scriptoria, right? Copying the gospel. So maybe they put some fanciful marginalia. Maybe they do very fancy, you know, capital letters. But the words are the same. They don't change the words. And the icon, for it to be an icon, it must be, in, now, my opinion here, but it's pretty orthodox, lowercase o, my opinion. Uh, the artist's imagination will always be subservient to the gospel and to tradition. So um, I, I know I saw now here I'm venturing into maybe dangerous waters, but um, uh, Bishop Curry. Uh, sort of celebrated uh, what was called an icon of uh, Christ like and Mary and Joseph. Um, it was an artist's painting of the flight into Egypt, right? Which is not a sub, not often a subject in iconography. Yeah, that's more of a Western subject, but they were depicted as being Latin American immigrants. And I thought, no. <laughs> because Jesus was a particular human who lived at a particular time in history. Um, and again, my opinion, 
no more would I want, let's say I live an exemplary life and I'm proclaimed a saint, even though the Episcopal Church really doesn't do that. Uh, and somebody were to paint an icon of me, they, I would want that to be an icon of me. I mean, of me transfigured, of me having been divinized, um, and not of, uh, I don't know, a Chinese man living in the 17th century, you know? So in the same way that we worship a particular God with a particular name, he hasn't told us what that is, but we say the God of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? That's, that's the God that, that we worship. Um, in the same way that we worship a very particular God, we are each created to be very particular persons. And that image of Christ that's within each one of us is in each one of our particular selves. So, um, so having said that, you know, the counter argument is, well, aren't you just copying ancient prototypes, right? You're just a copyist. Eh, you know, there I would say, well, was Glenn Gould a copyist when he plays a Chopin composition, right? He's performing that piece of music through his body. Um, so I've struggled to find the right way of explaining this. Finally, I've settled on what I think is the closest, which is that being an iconographer is a bit like translating a work of literature from one language to another. Um, you know, you're trying to capture the meaning of the image you're trying to use words that in a very particular way, and that's the best I can do. You know, there's, there is, it's, when I first started studying, I thought, oh, this is great. I don't have to be creative, right? I just do what my teacher says. And then I brought my icon up to Vladislav once. I said, Vladislav, what should I do? And he looked at me, he goes, I don't know, it's your icon. <laughs> and I realized that I had um, ascended um, one rung on the ladder. And that, in fact, you know, there is creativity, but it's always subservient to tradition. Um, I hope that helps. May I say one thing? I mean, that is an incredible dilemma to be, allow yourself to be creative and also maintain a certain kind of standard about how that person looked or what, um, what position that body took, because some positions would be more welcome to see than others, I'm quite sure. We don't ever see Jesus doing that. You know? <laughs> no, we don't. You also <laughs> never see Jesus in profile. In profile. The other right. things I have always thought that his feet must have been really dirty. <laughs> oh, yes. That's why right. the first we thing never he did see, was wash his feet. We barely ever see anything but little bitty toes, if that. <laughs> and I, it's just been a private little thing for me that <laughs> I would love to see the Jesus who walked and walked and walked yes. with sandals and dirty feet. Thank you so much for your teaching. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thanks for your interest. Other we are, questions? You we're on the hour. I just want to check that you have a little bit more time, Maureen. I do. I'm not okay. going anywhere. I'm home. Okay. <laughs> so are there other questions here? Hands? Yeah, I have a question, if that's okay. My father was raised in the Russian Orthodox Church. And so half of my, my paternal family is all still Russian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church. And I'm used to, I'm used to attending family events 
with icons where every family had an icon yes. in the corner of the living room with a red candle in front of it. And I'm wondering what in the, in the Eastern Orthodox church, what role do the icons in family homes play to them? That's a great question. Um, the icon is the home altar, the court, the icon corner uh, is meant to be the first thing you see when you walk into a house. Ideally, it's, you know, you're facing east. My house is very uncooperative. I don't have a good corner um, that would allow that. Uh, and I can tell you that once you live with icons enough, a room feels um, empty with, without them. When I have loaned icons for exhibitions, I get very lonesome for them. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is a way that really kind of sanctifies the home life and... Oh. Uh, are they personal? Are they What's personal? That? Are they personal to the family that has them, or are they? Uh, I or... think it depends. Um, you know, there. I've got an icon. Hang on one second. This is an icon I found on eBay. One of my better finds, um, and it's Saint George. And up here are three guys. Uh, that my, my, uh, this is Russian and my teacher has told me who they all are. I have forgotten, but they are probably the patron saints of that city. Um, they speculate that, uh, you know, St. George is the patron saint of farmers. Farmers? Well, Geo, right? Geo, Orge. Um, uh, so the family that had this icon at home was probably a farming family, and those are the patron saints. Um, let me put them down. So, and again, you know, I can't, I, I'm speaking a bit as an interloper, um, uh, you know, as, as someone who, who tries to be faithful to the tradition and um, who cannot be ac accused of being sort of a cultural appropriator, um, which is my concern a little bit, you know, frankly, with the uh, Episcopal Church's kind of wholesale embracing of the icon because there isn't necessarily an underpinning of theology. In fact, there's kind of, there's, there's really none. Um, so that's, that's my confession to you all. <laughs> and yet I am not interested in um, converting to orthodoxy, especially at this moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> so other questions yeah I think Gail uh, might have a technical question that um, she'd like to pose oh you're muted Gail, you're Gail. on mute <laughs> okay hold on there You talked about using um, the little lake or the puddle technique when, right. um, when painting the, the halos, I think in particular. So my question is, is that a technique that would do well on the entire icon or not? Um, we, didn't, we didn't talk about tools and brushes and all those other things right. that are important to creating an icon. So that was... That was my first question. Yeah, we, we do use a, the Russian 
Creek iconographers tend to work with almost a dry brush, their boards up on an easel, and they mm -hmm. almost create highlights through cross hatching. Um, okay. The Russian tradition is, um, you know, to lay the board flat. And mm -hmm. yes, we do this. Uh, and I will always hear Vladislav's voice puddle and push puddle and push okay. um, <laughs> where you're using the br you load the brush and you're trying to create a, a little lake petty lock um, mm -hmm. uh, when we lay down that clay bowl and then the other time we do that is when we're creating the ruskrish um, after those two moments we tend to, as we ascend uh, the, the Mount Tabor there um, with mm -hmm. each step, we tend to use finer and finer pigments. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not gonna use our precious um, azurite to create Roskrish. We're gonna save that for that final float, um, mm -hmm. but we will use very gritty, um, chunky, pigments to, to create the rust crush. And then after the pigment dries, we actually rub the grit off of the painting. Um, and, you know, there's an opportunity to think about asceticism, right, as a way of, of wiping off the extraneous bits that um, we no longer need in our life, you know, pack light before you climb that mountain. So, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, always I think, helpful. I think maybe we should wrap up unless there's any other burning question that somebody has. We um, have run a little bit long. Um, we'll be sending out a, a link to this recording after um, this presentation, and we'll also be sending some information about the workshop the from workshop. June. 13th to the, to the 18th um, at Trinity Southport. Um, and I think what we should do at this point, Peggy, is ask you to please pray us out for the evening. Uh, before we do that, I just had one quick comment to make, Mark. Uh, thank you so much, Maureen, for your presentation. It was absolutely fabulous. I wanted to go back to your comment about uh, interlopers. And I, too, am troubled by it. But I take consolation in this, and I like your reaction to it. I think with Resource Mind since Vatican II, so many of the churches, particularly uh, those of the, the Reformation, the Anglican Church, have taken ownership of their Latin roots or the Western Church's roots. So if you go back to, uh, you know, those early Ravenna and all of it, it's all there. So it all is the there. Lopers, or is it our right to claim these ancient traditions of picturing the Christ and the saints. So I, I just wanted to offer that and get your comments about it. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think that's that's very well said and um, something I remind myself about. You know, in the end, we, we all go, you know, we're all brothers and sisters. Um, and, you know, we... We do, we um, uh, Anglicans kind of, uh, I'm proud of the fact that we admit it when we're wrong, right? And through this ecumenical dialogue between the Anglicans and Orthodox theologians, largely in Cambridge or well, Oxford, um, you know, we found out, oh, we didn't, we didn't understand that. Um, and so there is a published statement, a joint statement that says, okay, you know, we misunderstood. Um, and that is something you're probably never going to hear, hear from the Orthodox Church, <laughs> which is kind of maybe why I'm where I am. We'll get um, there. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> We the hope. Holy Spirit will lead and guide. It's fine. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Thank you. So it, 
I, so I think with that, I, I also noticed that Gail very kindly has put her email into the chat box. You might want to copy that down if you're interested in the workshop, as she'll be taking the lead and organizing it. Um, but again, that'll be in the email that's going out after this. So we're all yours, Peggy. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm really excited that everyone here tonight has had a chance to get to know Maureen a bit. And uh, Maureen, we're so grateful to you for sharing your deep knowledge of iconography and iconology. And this has been such an incredible insight into the history, the process, the theology, so much you've offered to us. Um, I thought I would close with a prayer that is about the first iconographer, St. Luke, one of the gospel writers supposedly was the first iconographer, at least he's credited. Um, is that safe to say? <laughs> By tradition. By tradition. So let us pray. O divine Lord of all that exists, you have illuminated the apostle and evangelist Luke with your most holy spirit, thereby enabling him to represent the most holy mother, the one who held you in her arms and said, the grace of him who has been born of me is spread throughout the world. Enlighten and direct our souls, our hearts, and our spirits. Guide the hands of your unworthy servant so that we may worthily and perfectly portray your icon that of your Holy Mother and of all the saints for the glory, joy, and adornment of your Holy Church. Amen.